was and what a time it was, it was A time of innocence, a time of confidences Long ago it must be, I have a photograph Preserve your memories, they're all that's left you When I was uh, six years old, five or six, I uh, got a little ukulele and I took all the strings off, well, two of the four strings off and tuned them in one and a third, one and, and three, and I glued buttons on it to look like an electric guitar because I saw some uh, rock and roll guitar on uh, TV. And I went up and down the frets and learned Beatles songs. And um, so I knew I wanted to be a guitar player and a musician right away. I taught myself how to play the guitar and uh, got good enough to where my parents decided to buy me a $24, I don't know, it was a plastic guitar or something, you know. I, I remember it was just awful. And, uh, but it was my first guitar. And uh, I got a little blue chord book with all the chords in it. And I taught myself all the chords to Beatles songs out of this book. And, and Rolling Stones, Bob Dylan, all the stuff I heard on the radio. And uh, oh gosh, I guess a few years after that, uh, my, dad, my dad gave me a couple classical guitar lessons. And I did those for a couple months. And, my guitar teacher found pick marks in my guitar and threw me out of his class. So that was the end of my, so those were the only lessons I had, so, yeah. I hitchhiked to Chicago to play music. I knew there was a music scene here, even at 14. The band came about because we liked music. And we kind of fit together. We all like the same genres of music, it seemed like. The band, uh, you know, mine goes for a more country vein, but I also heard Dwayne Allman and uh, you know, the band and all these other cats, and I loved it. So naturally, I wanted to play all of it. Lou and I started Walter Williams' band, and then it progressed into finding better players. And of course, when we found Jerry Lee, and then David, such a great bass player and great singer, uh, the harmonies for the three of us was like we'd been singing together all of our lives. I don't know how. David and myself, because we're from down below the Cotton Curtain somewhere, that made sense. Okay, he probably had some church upbringing and stuff like that. But uh, and Jerry Lee's guitar playing, you know, how are you going to sidestep that? What Walter was all about was the relationships uh, that developed, like any family. <laughs> we fussed and we fought and we have our, you know, but I love every one of them dearly. I got out of high school a little early because I was playing music already. I started playing with my uncle's band at 15. And my uncle owned a nightclub. What nightclub did you have? It was called the Manor Lounge. It was on the corner of Lake and Mannheim in Stone Park. And he'd had it for many years. And uh, he had a band, they, they had two bands and they'd play hour on, hour off. And the bass player from the other band quit. And I'd, I'd been coming into jam sessions every Sunday. So I uh, was coming in with my little Japanese bass every weekend. And uh, one, uh, one day my uncle called me, and he uh, came over actually, and he said, he looked at my Japanese bass and he says, is that all you got to play? And I was like really insulted. He says, I got an old bass laying under my bed at home and I'll, I'll bring it to you tonight. And, that night he came by with the 1967 jazz, Fender Jazz bass. It was gorgeous. It was gorgeous. Beautiful bass. I lost it. Somebody borrowed it and then their house got raided by the police and it was confiscated. I never saw it again. The favorite gig I did with Walter Williams that Walter Williams did were the Chicago Fest gigs. Hey, hey, hey. 
Now my car sounds like an open can I'm wiping off with another man And I spray the muscle in my fishing hand My income tax is due The loss of my money in a poker game I think left leg is cold land Brother asked if I'd change my name And that's what I think I'll do Doctor told me not to smoke And not to drink So if I do I'll choke I was supposed to take dirty jokes When it had strange my heart now some people say I'm a pessimist and they say I should make the best of this Well maybe I am a pessimist, somehow I wouldn't know But you think that you got trouble Boy you're trying now the worse that it gets Well you think that the world don't like you So listen brother you ain't heard nothing yet Gonna build And drive myself to drink. But the seeds of the band started with the Shake Russell Band in Austin in 1974. They actually got together here in Chicago in 74. Don Ferroni, fabulous bass player, had a gig with Ron Crick, who was a singing cowboy, comedian, country guy. And he had gigs like crazy. Don was playing with him, and somehow they convinced Jerry Davidson to move from Seattle to Chicago to be in that particular band. And a, a drummer that I was playing with a lot, Mike Indovina, and myself and Don had grown up together, and we had been in bands together. And... Don ran into Mike and said, "Oh, you gotta come see this. You gotta come see this band. This Ron Crick is good, but this guitarist is unbelievable." So we went to the Bulls on Lincoln in early or late 1974, like November, December, and came in, and it was everything Don said about it. He was this young guy who had this touch and this tone and these, the, this interesting thing, and he was doing a lot with uh, a volume pedal to make the guitar sound like a, uh, a pedal steel, uh, which he used a little with Walter, but not a lot. I, I sat there kind of dumbfounded. I was like, God, this guy's an unbelievable guitarist. And then Crick goes, uh, a buddy of mine's in town. I want to get him up to sing a couple songs. His name's Shake Russell. So Shake gets up there and sang like three songs, and it was, it was quite a revelation to sit there and hear these fantastic songs sung by a, a great singer, and it was spectacular. And within a day or two, everyone had decided to go down to Austin with Shake and be in his band. And uh, it just felt like a whole different thing than what I was used to do and I was used to playing top 40 or funk or something like that and here was a chance to be like the band to be Garth Hudson and just mess around behind these fantastic songs so we went down there and we met uh, John Vanderveer the guy that wrote Coming Back Home uh, Walter Hyatt from Uncle Walt's band who wrote uh, Uncle Eli. We had all Shake songs. It was really exciting. We didn't play enough. We didn't, the band didn't play enough, and eventually broke up. It ended up strange, and Shake ended up taking off with Mara. And we all got left there, and I called. Um, I was the last one in the house. And rent was coming due, and I couldn't stay. So I called a fella who you might know here, uh, Chuck Hart. And uh, I called him up and said, help. And he didn't have a job for me at the time. But he knew of a band called Freewheel, who were playing Mr. Kiley's that might be looking for a guitarist. Because uh, their other guitar player, Mike Blasushi, wonderful guitarist, great, great telly player. He was leaving, and it was Janice Horst, Chris Mitchell, David Miller, and uh, and I ended up in that Kylie scene during Urban Cowboy action, and wow, that was great. And that's when David and I met, and David and I became fast friends, brothers, right on the spot. And uh, Lou Borden, 
used to come in to see us. And I think he even sat in sometimes. He had another band with Randy and uh, Patty. So Randy and Lou would come in, Lou mostly, and we would all party and have fun. And um, Mr. Kiley's was just an outrageous joint in those years, in the late 70s, mid to late 70s. And um, Lou decided after a while that he was going to put a band together because he didn't like his band. And he liked me and David. And Lou usually, once he got an idea in his head, usually figured out a way to do it. So that's kind of where Walter was born. And I was playing with a guy named Mike Lasucci. And he was playing for me and my band. And he quit. And I had other guitar players. And he came back and, and he was playing up at this place, uh, Nashville North it was called, in uh, Bensonville. So I went over there, and, and there was this young woman singing with his band. Janice Horst was her name. And Randy Mullins was also in the band. And one weekend, he came in with Janice Horst and this drummer named Chris Mitchell. And the three of them approached me at the club and asked me if I'd come to Chicago and play at a club called Mr. Kiley's with them. So I took the job, and... Uh, I started playing at Mr. Kiley's, and eventually a guy, the Mike Lasucci, the guitar player who'd come and got me out of that club to come play down there, within like two months I found out he's quitting. When Mike left to go to Nashville, we needed a guitar player. And there wasn't anybody around that I was interested in, and a guy named Chuck Hart had talked to Janice and said he knew this guitar player that was really struggling in Texas, he wasn't making any money, and he and his wife were not able to eat or anything. And so Chuck Hart really is the reason Jerry Lee Davidson came to, back to Chicago. He uh, took a drive-away van, put everything he owned in it, and came up to play with us, because we were playing six nights a week at the time. So that meant money for them. And I remember Jerry Lee walking in, and he had a ponytail, and... Fu Manchu, and I was looking at this guy like, I don't know about this at all. And then he played, and Mike was a real country player. We were playing real country music, and he had that chicken picking and all that stuff going on. And Jerry Lee comes in and goes, dee -dee 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 -dee. you know how Jerry Lee does it, sound that he gets. And I thought, oh, my God, I cannot play with this guy. This is not going to work. But within about two weeks, I knew this guy was going to be my brother forever. I would go to uh, Kylie's and I would sit in with the side men. Yeah. And I would leave wanting part of the band. And and that was you and Jerry Lee. Oh. And at the same time I was in the Rhythm Rangers with Mitch and Patty and Randy, and I longed for the uh, the soulful uh, guitar playing of Jerry Lee and your vocals. <laughs> and so when I was uh, when I came to Kylie's, I had uh, this ulterior motive, and I don't know how how close to the surface it was at any time, but it finally culminated in that situation where I thought that I had kind of started the band. Now that you tell me your side of the story, I think you're right. <laughs> but that's the way I saw it. I, I was, uh, I, you know, I went to Kylie's with that thought submerged right below the surface that these are the guys that I want to play with. And so every time Chris Mitchell would let me play, I felt a little guilty because <laughs> yeah, I, I was not just there to jam. 
I was there to glam. You were picking it. I was introduced to their music initially probably by the Peanuts show that was recorded. And I, I admired it uh, just because I grew up playing and, and, and being inspired by a lot of American music that felt like music that Walter Williams was drawing upon, um, like the band and um, country rock acts like the Eagles and things like that and their, the way their voices blend and, and the way um, that they play together with uh, this real kind of agile sense of time. And uh, that's just like not something people my generation were good at. But I love those records and I love getting to see someone able to play that music the way it sounded like it was supposed to be played. That was a really unique and beautiful experience to get not only this insight into that music, but to get this insight into Susie and, and feel this connection that she has with something so authentic and real. I think their music is really born out of love and you can tell that because uh, you don't get to, you don't, you can't become a musician that can play like that with other musicians without spending an enormous amount of time doing it and, and being able to develop that kind of intimacy with a bunch of other humans. I love that. I mean, they're, they're one of my uh, favorite bands that no one's ever heard of. <laughs> I used to book and manage them in the early 80s. It was also during the time period that they were doing the long run, and it was way easier to book the long run than it was to book Walter Williams' band. And so we came up with the genius idea of having the long run open for the Walter Williams' band, get paid twice. I came up with the idea for the long run. David brought a guy named Kenny Michaels, who was a uh, great singer, uh, good guitar player, excellent guitar player, and a guy named Terry King, who was a Randy type. He had kind of a gruff voice, and he was a good guitar player. And uh, 
He's a, he was a really, really, really good singer. So the three of them singing together was a, uh, uh, a legitimate thing, and it sounded kind of like the Eagles. And uh, I, I thought that there was a chance in the market that there was a Doors tribute band, I think, that I saw at the Iron Rail, and it packed the place. And it was, you know, the Doors have a certain uh, fan base that will come out for something like that. And I thought the Eagles were the same thing. And at that point, the Eagles had split up. And uh, so I conceived this long run thing. I talked to Sue Miller about it, and she was booking it, uh, bands at the time. And I said, look into it and see if you can book it. And she came right back and said, yes, I can book it. So I approached everyone in the band and said, listen, we could do this thing. We could do this tribute act and still be the Walter Williams band, too. We could book both. So we could be two bands. And there was a lot of energy at the beginning of it. And Sue was like, well, when's this going to be ready to, to go? And I said, well, it could be, uh, you know, like two months. And two months came and it was nowhere near because the initial energy kind of dissipated and people would come to the rehearsals and wouldn't have learned what they were supposed to learn. Pat had this idea for us to become a Eagles tri tribute band and we'd call ourselves the long run. And we thought, okay, you know, I mean, he was kind of explaining, yeah, we can make some, you know, make some money. You could be working. And I know now that was, that's very true. It was a very good idea to do that. But like I say, the band was an original band and I think we had some issues with doing that, but we actually ended up playing some shows as a long run. The first time I seen Walt Williams was, uh, boy, I think it could have been 1979, if that's possible, at Peanut Tap. And I just remember seeing it and I was just really blown away from that. You know, I just thought they really were gelling and they, they were good. You know, you would go see Walt Williams and think, man, I want to be in a band like this. And, you know, that's what it was like. And, you know, for a musician, you know, you go, man, because they're gelling. I mean, it's like they're doing like these really cool things. They were, they, I mean, I, I remember saying one time, I go, this is like seeing the Beatles. Actually, I really did say that. And it sort of was because it was like they were, they were just gelling. You know, they, they were like, they just meshed, you know, and... We were all young. You know, the things that I remember that are really good is, you know, being in a band that's actually playing and, and having a good night or something and everything, you know, you hear good, everything is just working. And that's kind of what I look back and and I think I'm happy about. I'm, I'm happy I had that. I'm happy I was in a band where you could gel and have a good night, you know, and, and like people like it and it kind of gets like a frenzy. I mean, you know, that's what I really like about playing. I think that's why I still play because I like those nights when things just go crazy. I can't remember the day we met such a long, long time ago When we were young and wild When we were young and wild Sit for the hook and ladder Down in the very last row There's a car on fire Flames getting higher and higher first tune I ever wrote was Poor For A While. And that was a song about actually at being a teenager, living on my own in West Seattle. And I shared this house that was up on bricks, up on stilts. Didn't have any heat. It had a little wood-burning stove in the living room. So the toilet would freeze over in the winter. And we'd have to chip the ice out of the toilet to go 
to the bathroom. And we'd have to boil water on the stove to pour into the toilet to get it to go down the pipes. Because all the pipes would freeze, the sink would freeze, the toilet would freeze. But it was a great house. I know that sounds ridiculous, but it was really beautiful. It had a view of the Alki out, out on the bay. And I wrote poor for a while, just about being happy and poor. And not giving a damn about it. And you can think that way when you're young. Am I right? We're gonna be poor for a while Cool our feet and live in style Never ever blink in the face Of the morning sun I give all the money away You can do your nails all day And we'll watch the sink freeze over when the heat is gone If you can see how You will believe now We can slow it down I wrote best to me before I was with Walter. Yeah. I was 17. <laughs> I wrote best of me. The Manor Lounge was my uncle's club, and it had burned to the ground. And I was out of a job. And that, I, I'd already quit school. And um, I was at my brother's house. My brother had this old Kmart guitar. And I came home late at night, and I sat on his couch and decided I was going to write a song for Willie Nelson. That's where it came from. So, you know, looking back all my life, I can see that I've done well. That's Willie Nelson, you know, and the only thing that was really going on in my world at that time, because I was adrift, was the fact that the manor had burned, and it turned into a song really about my uncle. You know, uh, I was in Covington for Christmas a couple days, a couple years ago. The club that I was working in caught fire and left me with no place to go. The club that I was working in caught fire and left me with no place to go. If someone who was doing good, I had to come an awful long way down. Yeah. Now I look and now I see I finally got my feet back on the ground. One of my favorite memories was when Craig started doing sound for us. Craig made our band. You know, I think we had the music side of us already. Craig's got elephant ears. And, uh, and he, could, he could pull the best out of each of us. It, it, it is bored. You need ears to, to know what to do, and, and Craig really did it. He's really, Craig Nelson is really the sixth member of Walter Williams because we never would have sounded as beautiful as we sounded, as orchestrated, as magnificent, unless Craig Nelson had done that. Got started in audio when I was driving a semi with my buddy Ralph and we stopped in at the Army World Headquarters and uh, Commander Cody was playing on stage, and the guy who was doing sound said, here, hold this while I go take a piss. I had a whole channels of tap go on my lap, and that was the first time I did audio, until I came back from California, and uh, I knew Lou from the house on Belmont, and I had been driving a truck in California, and wandered my way back to Chicago, and con my father into buying us two Sirwin Vega speakers, Crown D150, Sherp SM59, and a SM57. The next thing I know, I was doing audio at Peanuts with this band I knew. Pretty as a picture, she wears. 
there's that front row smile She came to see my 98th show How many? She saved up all her pesos Until I came to town She's got my picture on her wall Right next to Pat Brennan Oh my goodness Hocus pocus, I don't know no magic spell The kind to win your company Golly gee girl, sure could use some sympathy I kissed her and the roses Or was it on her two lips? I simply don't remember I simply don't recall at all Her eyes are full of moonlight Or was it just a street light? I simply don't remember I simply do Back in 1980, there were no cell phones. Uh, we weren't able to have any video uh, of uh, our performances at Chicago Fest. Uh, and we have uh, some film that we have found uh, that a fan captured on 8mm. Uh, this is grainy film, but it uh, shows us uh, performing at Chicago Fest. It's the only record that we have of that, so I hope you'll appreciate the uh, lack of film quality, but uh, it does deliver the essence. On stage, a Walter Williams fan, huh?
created a bond, a feeling of community, a feeling of connection that only the best bands make. And uh, the fact that it didn't translate into stardom or that type of success uh, measure, measure of success, um, doesn't take anything away from that or change that fact at all. Um, it's just harder to get other people to see it. Walter Williams, in my life, although pretty destructive at times for my own, during times of my own self-destruction, were some of the most enlightened, beautiful, musical moments of my life. And the guys in Walter Williams, you, Jim, Craig, all of the band members, are my brothers, my true brothers, and uh, I'll never forget it. The Walter years were the best years ever. The Walter years, like, glued friendships together for life. Like, I could cry. When I think of Walter Williams, I just think of all my longest and deepest friendships. It was a good time. It was a really good time. I miss it. <laughs>